That's great. I love Fourth of July, like my wife said. I think it's one of my favorite holidays. And I brought her into it, so she's part of the thing now. So I can say, baby, I'm lighting this firework off for you, you know. And that's right, that's right. I mean, she's the main firework, but, you know. I know. Aw, aw. <laughs> if this is your first time here, I just want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Matt. I want to welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're all here today. Uh, but if, you're not, if your first time is here, my name is Matt, and, and my wife and I are the pastors here, and we're just glad you're here. I'd love to get to meet you. I'll be hanging out in the lobby afterwards if you'd like to shake hands or just say hi. And we also know this, is that people will typically watch online for one or two messages before they come in. So I'd like to say hi to everybody who's watching online, and we would love to get to meet you also in person right here in a Sunday service, in a Sunday service. You know, I, I don't know what happened to my friends from high school. Do you guys have friends from high school that, that have hung around through the years? I have some great memories of high school. Um, I did some things that were um, really good. There were some things that I'm, I'm not going to share with you um, because they would incriminate me. But I had a friend, and his name was Jeremy, and uh, he had a 1967 Mustang GT with, I know, with the 289. I mean, it was awesome. And so we actually spent a summer, and by I say we, um, he probably did like 70% of the work, but I'd come over and help out occasionally. And, and he re, we rebuilt the engine on his, his Mustang, and, and we got it souped up, and we added some things, and, and uh, we, we did all kinds of work to this Mustang. It was like this cool, cool car that was baby blue, and uh, but he had a brand new interior in it, and it was just an awesome car to drive around. And, and we drove drove that thing all over the place. And, and by we drove, I mean he drove, and I rode in the passenger seat. But, but I, may, I might have driven it once or, or twice. But it was such an awesome car, and I had these amazing memories from, from that moment. But, but, you know, I don't know where Jeremy's at today. Like, I think about, oh, man, that was such a fun time. And, like, where'd that guy go anyway? I, was, I mean, since Facebook came along, I, I eventually connected with him on Facebook. And so I, I've seen him on Facebook, but I literally have not seen the guy's face since high school, probably, right? But I had these amazing memories of how things used to be and how things were at. And I think he's married and has kids and, and everything else. But what happened? Like, how, why is it that friendships can drift apart? Have you ever noticed that relationships can, can just tend to separate over time? There wasn't anything bad there. In fact, I think the world of the guy. So, Jeremy, if you're watching online, I, I'd love to reconnect. But, but I'm just saying, like, like, it's one of those things where I think of the world of the guy, right? But, but what happened? Things just kind of eventually eroded. I mean, I went this way, he went that way, and, and things just kind of went a little bit different. I have friends that are closer now. You know, like, I have friends in my life, and it's like, how is it that I have great memories with them, too? So, so what is the, the measurement between a close friend and a distant friend? Now, if you, if you hang around me long enough, you're going to know this. I'm like an analytic data junkie guy. Like, I got to have numbers. I want numbers and spreadsheets and charts and graphs. And, and like, I'm so into numbers, I bought this thing and put it on my wrist, and it gives me all the numbers of my health. And I started wearing it. My wife makes fun of me. I start wearing it at night at sleeping, and I get up in the morning, and I check my app and see, like, how restless was I? And did I move around or not? And how many calories did I burn? And, and, and you're like, oh, well, how many did I eat? Because if I burn more than I eat, then I'll lose fat. But if I eat more than I burn, I'll gain fat. And, you know, because it's science. And it's like an equation, right? I love the equations and the things and the, and I got, I get so into it, I got a scale. And I, I know, like, like not a scale. I got, a, I got a, a Matt Williams version of a scale. So now you stand on this thing barefoot and I know, hear me out, you stand on this thing barefoot and yes, it has Bluetooth and yes, it syncs to my phone. Um, that's just a given. <laughs> and so there's a scale and you climb on this thing and you stand there and it, and it tells you your weight, but then it does like this scanning thing and then it beeps at you. And then pretty soon it tells you your BMI and your body fat percentage and your bone density and your lean muscle mass. And I don't know how it's, it's Bluetooth magical science stuff. And it shoots electrons through your body, which is probably healthy. And, and so it does this thing and it scans the body when you stand on this thing. And, and so I get the, all that data gets compiled into the app with my watch and the thing. And, the, and I'm always like obsessing over the data. And I want to know the data. Do they have a scale and a watch for friendships? Why don't they have analytical data for relationships? 
Like if X plus Y equals Z in my health, if I know if I can add these three components together, then this happens in my body. Like, like I know these things. That, like that's, that's science, isn't it? Like if I do the dishes twice a month, take out the trash once a week, and bring flowers to my wife once a quarter, that equals a happy wife. <laughs> right? Uh, kind of? Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting mixed signals here. I'm getting, so maybe if I do uh, dishes once a week, flowers once a month, and a back rub on Fridays. Are we getting there? Yeah, back rubs are good. No, more back rubs. It's just more, right? It's just more, more is better. So, but like, what's the formula? Because, you know, if you, if you get enough of the right pieces in there, then, then we have a happy, happy marriage, right? Is it a formula? Listen, relationships can't get broken down into formulas, can they? It's not data. It's not, re- you know what I mean? Like, like it's time spent and it's quality time spent. And, and how do you quantify quality time spent? Because I don't know. I want numbers and a graph and a pie chart. I want to know that I'm winning, I want to know that I'm winning, right? Like, like in, in, and so how in relationships do you measure these things? I just, I'm just saying, if you figure out a scale that you can stand on, and in 30 seconds it can give you an analytical feedback, maybe two scales, the wife stands on one and the husband stands on the other, and there's like a wire between them, you know, or a Bluetooth, I guess, right? So they, they all Bluetooth together and they lurch your phone and... No, that sounds terrible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I figured out if I do the dishes twice a week, flowers every, uh, tw- uh, twice a month, and a back rub um, three times a week, um, that thing, things seem to go pretty, pretty good. And my wife was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> That's happened twice. It's happened twice. That's why we have two kids. So this is important. Be- <laughs> This is important because, because relationships matter, right? The quality of relationships matter. And so you want to be able to measure, right? You want to be able to say, well, I want a quality relationship with my spouse or, or my brother or my sister or my mom or my, or my dad. And, and, but what about your relationship with God, right? What about your relationship with God? We're in church. We're going to talk about the relationships and we're talking about the relationship with God. And sometimes it's hard to measure. And, and hear me out, because I want my hope today is that you will leave here inspired and ready to lean in to all of the spiritual growth and relationship that God has for you. Because he has more for you than you currently have. He wants you to grow more like Christ. He wants you to be, um, become more Christ-like and to have a deeper relationship with him. He wants to have a deeper relationship. You know what I'm saying? Well, here's these things. Is my wife happy? All the women are like, well, you could do maybe a little more, right? There's a little more, right? Listen, it's not about doing, it's about being in relationships. What you do or who you are and how you behave and how, who you are, there's, there's more of a being than there is a doing in relationships. So the Bible has a lot to say about this. And so we're in the middle of this series called Jesus is Greater Than, Jesus is Greater Than, and we're going through the book of Hebrews, and we're doing a chapter a week. So through the summer, there is about 13 weeks of summer. There's 13 weeks in Hebrews, and I am not a mathematician, but I think that it works out. We do one chapter per week. And so I'm not able to get to every verse in every chapter, but, but we're going one chapter at a time, highlighting the main theme or a theme inside of that chapter, inside of that chapter. In fact, I, I got to say next week, so during the summer, I'd like to invite friends to come and preach and share in the church. And, and over the next, I think, six or eight weeks, we have a handful of people come. And I'm preaching in there too, but um, we have some friends. Next week, I have a friend of mine coming who is, I am just absolutely stoked that he's going to be here preaching. And, um, and, uh, and he, Amber and I will be here on the front row, like, like cheering him on. And so um, he is a phenomenal preacher, um, an amazing Bible communicator. He's, he's actually an associate pastor of another church here in town. And I can't wait for you guys to hear him share. Um, he's actually going to dovetail right into our series. And so I just want you to come, come back next week, bring a friend. It's going to be um, an incredible week with an incredible preacher um, next Sunday. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. It's going to be a surprise. Uh, and I'm intentionally not telling you because it's going to be a surprise. All right. So, so here we are in Hebrews chapter 
5. Hebrews chapter 5. So the first 10 verses in Hebrews chapter 5, it's outlining, outlining this idea about a high priest. And, and, and there's like this thing that's happening inside of, of the, the author is writing to the reader of this, of this uh, the, in the he, book of Hebrews. He's writing this thing and he's saying, listen, I need you to understand this. And I can't go verse by verse through this first section. I want to skip through this quickly so we can understand the second section of the chapter. And so in verse one going through, it talks about the relationship of, of Jesus being the high priest. And, and, and to you and I, we go, okay, high priest, sure, yeah, whatever, we read on, but because that may not fit into what we're thinking. So, so let's, let's look at this. Number one is, is the function of a high priest is to offer sacrifices for sin. You see, in, in the Old Testament, the, the high priest, see, the people would bring their sacrifices, and the high priest would be the one who would offer the sacrifice for people's sin in, into up to God. He would facilitate that. And so that, that was one of the main functions of the high priest. And so there was a couple of qualifications for a high priest. A couple of qualifications. There's qualifications for the job. Number one was, was they had to have a gentle and understanding um, attitude with people. You look at verses two and three, gentle understanding um, with people. You had to be able to be a people person and understand where they're coming through, coming from. If you keep going in verse 4, it says that they had to be appointed by God and not by himself. You can't appoint yourself to be the high priest. This is something that has to be done by the hands of God. I'm telling you, I don't know what the high priest goes through um, in the Old Testament times, but it sounds like it would be a high-pressure kind of job. So if God isn't calling you to it, it sounds like it would be miserable. But if you keep moving through, it changes halfway through between verse 4 and verse 5, and it says that Jesus has these qualifications. Now, I know I'm, I'm kind of digging in. Bear with me. It's all going to connect at the end. Jesus has these qualifications. If you go to verses 5 and says, 6, it says that he was appointed by God. So Jesus was appointed by God. And he shared human sufferings, verse 7 and 8, and verse 9 and 10, so Jesus can perform the fun functions of a high priest. So that's what is outlined, verses 1 through 10. And here's why this, this matters. See, priests were chosen from men to represent men to God. So when Jesus came down to earth, he had to come to earth and be human in order to be chosen to be the high priest, the mediator between humanity and God. It, the whole thing was a setup, right? It was, a, it was the stepping stone towards getting to where he was trying to get to. So priests were chosen from men to represent men to God. They offer gifts and sacrifices to God. They worked as a mediator between man and God. So because Jesus came to earth as a man, he was able to be qualified to be the high priest. Because he can't be, become the high priest when he starts at the top. He comes down as man. He has to deal with what men deal with in order to be able to become the high priest the way that whole thing was set up. So no one chooses this for himself. You have to be chosen by God. And so God chose Jesus and positioned him into being this way. He anointed him. He called him. He appointed him to be this. God chose Jesus. And it says in there, in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Who? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And it's like you, you and I, we glance past that, don't we? In order of Melchizedek. I don't know, some random old guy. And just keep on reading. But, but that had so much implication. I mean, that's a whole sermon in itself. In fact, this is week five, uh, chapter five, six, chapter seven. We're diving deeper into that um, Melchizedek concept. And it's, it's, it's really amazing. But for the brief synopsis today, Melchizedek was called the king of righteousness. He was both a king and a priest. He was a king priest. So he was both the ruler and the priest in the order of that. So Jesus was not just the priest, but he's also the king, and not just any king, but a king of righteousness. So when he says in the order of Melchizedek, oh man, that really blows out to being a really, really deep, deep thing, and, and, and we'll expand on that in a couple weeks. The other thing is this, is that Jesus was the last high priest. You see, when you look at the Bible, page one, God creates heaven and earth and creates mankind. Page two, mankind screws it up by sinning right? And so now there's sin that's separating um, an unholy people from a completely holy God. 
And from that page all the way forward, you start to look how there is a reconciliation effort that God and man are trying to become back reconciled together. And so man would, would offer sacrifices to God to try to appease their sin in order to be back in right relationship with him. And you go all the way through, and on the very last page, in the very last chapter of Revelation, Jesus comes again, and we're back, in res- re- re- back up in heaven, and now we are now back in relationship with God in the same place that he is at, which means this, between page two and the 1,368, whichever kind of Bible you have, the whole story of the Bible is about God getting reconciled back with humanity so we can back up in a relationship with him. The Bible is not a book of God condemning humanity and issuing punishments and, and thou shalt not. No, the whole thing is about, hey, we want to be in right relationship together. God is pursuing us, and we have a way to get back to him. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he offered a different kind of sacrifice. He offered himself as a sacrifice, as a sinless man, as a sinless, he was 100% man and 100% God, but when he sacrificed himself, he was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the final sacrifice necessary in order to pay for the sins of humanity. This is why this is so important. This is why this is, is, so, is so, so big, such a big deal. He was the last high priest. He still is the high priest. He still is the boss. Listen, I am not the senior pastor of City Church. Jesus is the head of the church. I'm just a campus pastor. I don't know what you would call me, but like I work for him. You know what I mean? So like Jesus is still the top of the church. Jesus is still in the position of what you would call a high priest priest. He is the final high priest. He made the final sacrifice so that we can be in right relationship with God right here, right now. The formula that I talked about earlier has already been completed by Jesus. The formula now is not what we do. It's who we follow. It's not what we do. It's just who are we following? Who are we following? You see, Jesus built a permanent bridge between man and God. Now, I know that there's some of you people, some people in the room here are saying, yeah, Matt, I totally got this. I, yeah, sure, I get it. I, you know, we got this. Some people are like, oh, yeah, I, I, mean, I kind of understand this. You might be here today going, like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. But that's okay. We'll get there. So if you look at this, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. About this, we have much to say. About this, about this. He's, he's continuing his stream of thought. This is the high priest. This is the relationship. This is what has been done for us. And about what has just been written, they have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Whoa. Slow your roll. Dull of hearing. It's kind of insulting. Your mom's dull of hearing. You know, like, that's kind of insulting, isn't it? Like, like, in fact, some translations, when you look at it, we start looking at the way the phrase is used. It's been translated in different phrasings, actually, if you look in different translations of the Bible. And so you start to look and you start to see where the original language translated into English. You see, it says, slow to understand. That's like thick in the skull. You know, like, like you're having a hard time processing. Or we don't want you to become lazy in your ears. In fact, one translation says it this way. We do not want you to become still lazier than you are. <laughs> wow. Okay. You're not mincing words here. After this, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you have become lazy. You're not hearing this. Hmm. Verse 12. Okay, let's move on. Verse 12, so, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. He's basically calling him a baby, right? Like, does the baby need a bottle? You know, like, like let me give you the bottle, you know? And so it's, it's like, he's kind of, okay. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish from good and evil. You can distinguish between good and evil. One of the versions of the Bible, the message version of the Bible, says it this way. And I think it's always a great commentary's perspective to see what the message version says. And it tries to put it in the most common, plain English language possible. It says, by this time, you ought to be teachers yourself. Yet, 
here I find you, need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again, starting from square one, baby's milk, when you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners, inexperienced in God's ways. Solid is food, food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. Wow, okay. So he's basically calling them a bunch of babies. And not like elementary age babies, like children. He's calling them like, like baby babies, like you need a bottle with some milk babies. He's basically saying, you should have progressed further, but you got like stunted in your growth in this area. Like, like you just, you haven't really grown. Have you ever met the person who physically has matured in age, but emotionally they're still a child? When it comes to 4th of July, that's where I'm at. I revert back to my childhood. I get giddy and I fire. Instead of progress, you're spiritually immature, though. Maybe you've seen those people, or maybe sometimes you think you're there. It says they're constant practice. It's, it's the same reference when it's talking about the constant practice in that last verse, that the physical fitness, the mental fitness, the training... It doesn't mean that you practice evil things so that you know what the evil things are. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to practice evil to know what evil is. You know what I mean? It means you, you're practicing the good so that you have the contrast between what good and evil is. In fact, when bank tellers are being trained in counterfeit money because they handle cash all the time, they don't hand them every option of counterfeit. All they do is show them the original. And they train them, feel the original. Look at the original. Look at the texture. Know the dimensions. Look at the graphics with details. When you study the original to ex extents on the dollar bill or the, the bills that are handed to you, as soon as a counterfeit comes into your hand, you're going to feel the difference. You may not be able to say that doesn't quite look, that did, all you can say is that that doesn't quite look right. I'm not sure what's wrong with this. And it begs you to start to investigate further to find the counterfeit. When you are well-practiced in the Word of God, when you are well-practiced as a believer and a follower of Christ, the challenge here is to grow closer in your relationship with God and to follow closer. And as you practice and as you follow and as you have the relationship going with, with Jesus, you, you start to become more practiced and you all of a sudden the discernment between good and evil becomes easier for you. You start to see it clearer. Sometimes it just doesn't smell like right. You know when you open the fridge and you're like, something doesn't smell right in there. I don't know what it is. And then it's Russian roulette with all the Tupperware and that's in there because you're like, something's wrong. And, then I don't, and you have little drawers, the produce drawers. And, and, and you're like, do you ever do that? Take turns with your wife. Who's going to open it in what order and try to find it? It's like, rush. No? Okay. So you open it up and you're like, you're cracking the Tupperware and it's like, you know, you open it and, and the, the dead tail sign is when the Tupperware used to be pressed in, but now it's bulging up, you know? You have some visual evidence, and then you crack it, and it's like, whoa, okay. The other day, we had something start to go bad in the fridge, and it was, you know, one day we opened it, and I was like, something smells a little off, and Amber says, I'm not sure, maybe, yeah. And it was really, really subtle, and, and that was in the morning, and later on in the day, the, the smell got a little stronger, you know, and so we opened the fridge, and, and Bria, my youngest, she opens the fridge, and she's like, ew, mommy, it smells like someone farted in the fridge, and, and so we're like, Yep, you just signed up for Russian roulette in the fridge, yep. You don't have to understand the intricacies of evil and wrongdoing to know that it's evil and wrong. You don't have to know. I didn't know what was wrong in that fridge. Nobody knew what was wrong in the fridge, but we knew something was wrong in the fridge. Eventually, we discovered it and removed it, the wrongness. It was chicken. There was some chicken that had gone bad. That has a very distinct smell if you leave it long enough. Blech. Mm. Man. So there's a couple things about following Jesus. Number one is this, is following Jesus leads to deeper maturity. Following Jesus will lead to deeper maturity. I got to say that no matter what you're doing in life, you're following something or someone. You are. Everybody's following something. Everybody's a slave to something. Everybody's influenced by something. The freedom that Christ gave you when he paid the price on the cross is we now have the freedom to decide what it is that we're going to follow. We have the freedom to decide who we're going to follow and what's going to be influencing us. We are no longer held captive by the influences of the past. We now have the power through Jesus to be able to break free from that and to be able to follow him. And so you, everybody's influenced by something. Just listen to someone talk and pretty soon you know what they're influenced by. That'd be influenced by ESPN. Real housewives of whatever city. 
Following Jesus leads to deeper maturity. Christian maturity requires personal development. It requires the act of following. You decide, this is who I'm going to follow. It's interesting. You look at the development of a human being in relation to food and eating, and, and, and a baby is, is milk, right? That's everybody, we got that down. But when you get to a child, like six, seven, eight, when it's dinner time, what do they do? They run to the table, they sit down, and whatever you've prepared, you put on the table, and then they instantly complain about it, and right? They, they, I'm just kidding. They, they eat. They can't. They don't go make their own meals at six years old. The, the adult has to make the meal for them, right? And then they, they keep growing, and they grow, and they, and then they get to the teenager. Now, the teenager can now open the cabinets. They can operate a microwave. So the diet consists of Doritos and hot dogs. And, and nacho cheese somehow will fit in there for sure. That's like a staple, right? But they don't have the ability to go earn the money and, and, and pay for the groceries, but they might be able to take your money to the store and buy some groceries. Very limited, really, um, supply, especially if it's a teenage boy, because I'm very familiar with that path. Um, not as familiar with the teenage girl path, because uh, I was not a teenage girl. But the... Um, science. Teenager can open the cabinets, microwave some leftovers. They can do those pieces right there. Now, I do hear that teenage girls, my girls are not teenagers yet, but they can actually cook in teenage years. Is that, is that true? Yeah, okay. Some teenage girls can actually prepare real meals. I'm getting thumbs up from all the women. That's right. That's right. So, but adult, adult is this. You go to the store you buy the ingredients. You combine them in a creative and fun way. You saute things. I did not know what saute was for the longest point of my life. You can saute things. You can make amazing combinations that, that, that tingle the palate. And, and you can create these complex gourmet meals exactly to your liking. And you can get into the minutiae and the, the very detail-driven things of, of pairings of different types of foods together in order to create amazing things, can't you? As an adult, you, you learn these skills and you start to combine these things. Spiritual growth is somewhat the same. I can say as a child, yeah, Jesus, he died on the cross and saved me. Yep, I get to go to heaven. You know, like, yeah, sure. I, yeah, I love Jesus. But as you grow and you follow the Lord, things start to happen. All of a sudden, you can microwave some stuff. All of a sudden, you can do some basic cooking on your own. You know, when you start to get further and further now, all of a sudden, you can take the cookbook, which is the Bible, and to be able to read through it, and, and the God will open and unlock things on a deeper level the more you study and the more that you follow and the more that you are engaged in a relationship with God. The more that you engage that way and are in there, all of a sudden, God starts to unlock greater and greater things. Well, as a teenager, you can prepare food for a child. And as an adult, you can prepare food for a teenager. And as you grow in your faith and in your knowledge and as you, as you grow in your relationship with God, what this guy is saying, the author is saying, is that as you grow in the Lord, you should be able to teach those who are a step back and behind you. You do not have to be a master celebrity chef in order to feed a child a meal. You might just be two or three steps ahead of somebody else in their life. But if you are learning and growing in the Lord, you, there should be something inside of you that comes out as you are teaching and guiding those who are maybe just one step behind you. If you're leading a small group, guess what? You don't have to have the whole book memorized and mastered. You just have to read the next chapter before they get there. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it, you don't have to be 18 steps ahead. You just have to be one step ahead, just enough to facilitate a, a discussion. You can start to pour into and invest in other people. It doesn't require a college degree. It doesn't require a seminary degree. You don't have to have an MDiv or anything after your name. You can just take what God has shown you and start to invest in the lives around you. That's what he's saying is, is are you just stuck on milk? Are you just taking what was handed to you? Or are you developing that? Are you developing that? Are you developing that? See, the goal of your life is to become more and more like Jesus, which is why we stick it on the walls and print it everywhere that you find it around here. It says, live like Jesus and share his love. You live like Jesus and we, and we share his love. In order to become more like something, you got to be around it more. You know why my relationship with my friend from high school just kind of fell away? Because I didn't hang around him that much. You know why my relationship with my wife is so great? I see her on a pretty regular basis. On a pretty frequent basis, I'm around her. When you're just around someone, the friendship deepens through a natural process. I'm not saying you got to do all these things. I'm just saying be around Jesus. Follow him. 
difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Number two was, was this, is following Jesus has some potential distractions. Following Jesus has some potential distractions. And the first one is this, is stunted growth. Sometimes you get stuck at a level, don't you? You get stuck, maybe you don't. Some people, I don't know, they're not here today, obviously, but some people might get stuck at a level. Maybe you felt that way before. You've been growing in your relationship with God, and you kind of found yourself in a plateau-ish area. It's just like, I just kind of got stuck here, and I'm not really, like, progressing or regressing. I'm just kind of in this area. Sometimes you can get stuck in a plateau or, or an area, Sometimes the temptation is to start to point your finger to other people or in other situations and say, well, it must be their fault. I'm not being fed in this environment. I need meat. I don't need milk. Have you heard someone say that before? There's, there's times where they, they, they will reference even this concept of milk and meat. You know, my eight-year-old complains about the food at the table sometimes. I'm an adult, and I cook my own food, and um, I like it. I, I think it's really good, and not as good as my wife's cooking. Obviously, she is exponentially better, but, but as you are growing up in the Lord, your cooking skills improve. If you're not happy with the food that you're eating, start looking into your cooking skills. Start reading the Word a little bit more. Start spending some time in, in prayer. Start, if you feel like I'm plateauing in this place, Sometimes you can take some ownership and, and be able to say, okay, God, I, I'm stuck in this place. And you can say, God, I'm stuck in this place, and I need your help. Will you help me? And I know that God is faithful to help you get through those plateaued areas. Get those plateaued areas. Listen, you can't just eat on Sunday mornings. You can't just be fed on, on Sunday mornings in a sermon. If I just ate once a week, I would be starving. Your spirit's not that much different. All right, number two, chasing revelation. Sometimes we think new revelation is what I need. We think like what we learned before is no longer meat, but we must have the new thing. And there's a temptation, and it's, and it's a real pitfall, and it happens. Sometimes we've, it's like, well, I've heard this before, blah, 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 blah. Tell me something new. And let me find something new. And we get addicted to the new revelation and the new information that, that you know, we're looking for because that's what starts to spark our mind and starts to spark us on the, on the inside. And, and you get addicted to the spark of the new information. Maybe you've never been there, but I've been there. I, I want to I learn something new because I already know this other stuff. And you start to think, well, meat must be different than milk. And if truth isn't different, then it isn't new, which means it isn't meat. Newness is not a requirement for meat in a spiritual sense. Now, in a physical sense, don't eat old meat. That, that'll end badly for you. See, meat is what you chew. It's not what's new. Meat requires chewing, and, and, and you think about it. You're kind of grinding it, and you're in your mouth. And when you hear something in the Word, do you stop and meditate? Like, like, that's what meat starts to do, right? You start to have to think about it and process it. It's the simple truths that I am aware of that create the most problems for me. Loving my neighbor as myself, I got the neighbor on this side of me no problem, and, this, and that one and that one, but, but on this side of me over here, oh man, I'm not sure if I really like that guy next door. And so, well, God, can you just make them move, like sell their house? I can get a new neighbor that's easier for me to love. And I start to think about this. Well, then Jesus said this crazy thing where the, your neighbor isn't the one who's geographically located next to you in your house. Jesus says that your neighbor is the people that you come in contact with every day. You mean the guy in the cube farm next to me at the office is my neighbor? Yeah. What about the guy that's on the fourth floor? Because I'm on the third floor. Like, we're geographically... Nope, he's still your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's easy to love the people that you like, but what about the ones that you don't? What about the neighbor that's, like, driving in the car next to you on the freeway? Oh, that guy. That's where I draw the line. He is definitely not my... He is not from here. That annoying coworker. What about your ex-wife or ex-husband. They're not easy to love either, right? If we're not careful, we can neglect the foundation and we can start to chase after new, 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 new and neglect the simple truths that God is trying to say, hey, you, 
you're not even mastering the simple things yet. Sometimes we get stuck in a superiority complex. Like we found the superior truth, like, and we look down on those who aren't there yet. Listen, that, that is not the right attitude to have when you are pursuing spiritual growth and spiritual truth in your life. See, pride takes over, and, and then a judgmental spirit can develop, and, and our closeness with God can suffer in that process. Because it says in Scripture that God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. The last one is this is information versus application. One person's meat might be another person's milk. See, almost every church, inclu including this one, you'll have a sermon where it's like, oh, that sermon was like really heavy. And you have another one that's maybe more light. You have one that's more simple and one that's more complex. You might, if the band would come, I'm going to close in just a minute. But you might have, even in one sermon itself, you might have parts that are, that are, that are, that are easier and parts that are, that are harder. As you're reading through Scripture at home, you're going to have parts that really impact you in a deep way and parts that you kind of gloss over from, from time to time. If you're always just looking for the new information in a new way of looking at things, you're missing something because the application is more important than the information. The amount of application is the difference. You can know the entire Bible, but if you're not applying any parts of it, there's a challenge, there's a problem. If you're constantly chasing new information, new revelation, I want to say that I don't know if that means you're becoming more Christ-like. You might become more knowledgeable of, but if you're not, that's not translating into application into our daily lives. The purpose is for you to become more Christ-like, not fill your head with more information. I know that lifting bigger, heavy, heavier weights at the gym will make bigger muscles on my body. I know that eating more ice cream will maybe cause me to get more out of shape or in a different, rounder shape. Still in shape, isn't it? I know these things, right? But if I don't apply those things, it doesn't matter what I know. Yeah, you can know it, but if you don't apply it, there's a difference. You can know what the speed limit is, but if you don't apply it, you could still get into a lot of trouble or even into an accident, right? There's information and there's application. Application makes the difference. I'll tell you this. I don't care how much of the Bible you read. I care how much you apply. And if, if it means you're reading one verse a day and that's all you're looking at and you're applying that one verse, that is better than to read an entire book of the Bible every day, put it back on the shelf, and walk away unchanged. There's a quote that I read, and it says, it's not what men eat, but what they digest that makes them strong. It's not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. It's not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. And it's not what we preach, but what we practice that makes us Christians. My last point today is this, is following Jesus is a personal decision. Following Jesus is a personal decision. You see, relationship is greater than religion. Relationship is greater than religion. See, the relationship is something that we're talking about when you're following Jesus, when you have a relationship, that is greater than following the rules. When we feel the stall, when we feel the plateau, when we feel the, 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 the maybe the, the, the lack of growth in our life, when we feel that, that, that thing that happens, I want to turn and maybe you can relate, but I want to turn to metrics and data that I can look at. If it's broken, I want to fix it. And if I can't understand it, then I can't fix it. And so in my need or, or desire for understanding, I want to look at metrics, right? I want to look at a scale that gives me a readout with stuff that Bluetooths to my phone and I matrix the whole thing together in a 3D spreadsheet, right? Like I want the data and I want to, med I want to do all of these things. So here's what happens in the quest for that thing, is that you start to look at what are the, what's the data in my spiritual life, and you depersonalize your relationship with God down to nuts and bolts. I cannot depersonalize the relationship with my wife down to how many times I bought her flowers and how many times I took the trash out. That does not constitute a relationship with my wife. That does not constitute a relationship with God. 
Sometimes when we feel stuck, we can go into this crazy mode, right? And it's not crazy, it's a natural thing to drift into this place where, where we start to put the nuts and bolts together. I want to scale with a readout. Well, I'm spending 10 minutes a day reading the Bible and 10 minutes a day praying. I feel plateaued. Therefore, I must do 12 minutes, 15 minutes, 18. I'm going to do this and do that. I'm going to walk two old ladies off the, across the street this week because maybe my, my charity isn't what it should be right now. I'm going to, I'm going to do this, and I'm, going to, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And, and God, I'm, I'm doing all these things for you. Don't you see me doing these things? I'm trying to do these things so that we have a relationship and a connection. And, and the writer of Hebrews in chapter 5 is saying this. Stop. He's already paid the price. He's already paid the sacrifice. You don't have to do this again with another priest. He is the high priest. He made the sacrifice. Stop the do and just be. A relationship with God is a decision that you make, and it's a position that you put yourself in to say, I'm just going to be with God. It's not a checklist. It's not a, a spreadsheet. It's not A relationship is not a spreadsheet and a checklist. It's quality time spent. And that quality time can be double dipped, by the way, I might add. You can put worship music in on your car while you're driving, and you can have quality time with the Lord in your car, eyes open, of course. You can be worshiping, double dipping on your, on your ride, ride to work. It's quality time. It's speaking and listening. Sometimes we get to talking all the time, and, and we don't make time for God to speak back. Are we talking about God? And, and, and are we just going to stop, relax, chill? We can just talk to him and say, God, I'm having a hard day today and I could really use something. Or, man, God, thank you so much for what you did. and I just love you so much. And when you express yourself to God, will you just stop? Let the silence linger. And just say, God, I'm listening for your voice too. It's a conversation. It's a it's a relationship. It's not a doing. It's not a checklist. It's not a spreadsheet. You might be here this morning and, and maybe you've boiled your relationship with God down to a checklist. I want to challenge you today. Throw your checklist out the window. Stop trying to do it. And just pause. Just relax. God, I know that you're real. I believe you. Sometimes we get so wound up with the doing that we forget just to be. We want to justify our progress. My, my, my wrist thing and my scale thing and my phone thing, they all tell me that everything is good. Why do I feel so bad? Because you're looking at it wrong. You might be here this morning and maybe you've never made the personal decision to follow Jesus. Today's can be a day where you make that decision. Maybe you've been a follower and you say, I need to make the decision to just relax and just be in God's presence. Maybe you're here and you've ma never made the decision to actually follow him. You've been interested in him. You maybe read about him. Jesus actually never called believers. He never walked up to the shores to his disciples and the people and said, I want you to believe. And he said, I want you to follow me. And Jesus is calling you today to be a follower. Not just a believer, not just an information, but a follower. He wants to have an actual relationship with you. One-on-one, -on -one, personal. And if you've never made that decision today, Today would be a great day to make that decision. Church, will you stand with me? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to pray with you. If you're here today and you want to make that personal decision, we have prayer teams that want to pray with you. It's a personal decision. I'm not going to put you on parade. I want you to be able to receive prayer with someone and have them guide you through that. We'll have prayer teams on either side of the stage ready and to pray with you today as soon as the service is ending. And Heavenly Father, I just pray right now for this church, for these people, for this congregation. God, I pray for everyone that's in the building or listening online or watching online. God, I just pray right now that everyone here, that, that God, we would understand that you are not a formula of do's and don'ts. God, you are a relationship. 
You are a relationship that we grow in, that we, that we mature in, that, that gets stronger with time and, and quality time spent. And so God, I ask that you would help every one of us throw out the crazy checklist that we've invented in our head and let us just focus on you, God. Let us spend quality time with you. And for those this morning that are making a decision to follow Christ for the first time, or maybe you walked away and you said, today's the day I'm going to follow again. God, I pray for those people today, God, that, that you would spark and put a spark in them, that you would nudge them, that you would bring them back into relationship with you. Let your spirit just surround them right where they're at. God, I pray as we go from this place, God, that we wouldn't get stuck, plateaued. We wouldn't forget the simple things, God. We would just apply the basics because, God, application of the basics will just bring the growth. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, let's sing one last song before we leave today.